Welcome to the Life Rocks podcast. In this podcast, we explore how nature, science, education, and culture can benefit all children and future generations. This is a show for educators, parents, mentors, and anyone interested in making the lives of our children, families, and communities better. So sit back, take a breath, and enjoy the show. And now for your host, Asher Cloran. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Life Rocks podcast. I am here today with Andrea Robinson, who is the zoo school coordinator at Calgary Zoo. And when I was traveling in Canada, I was having a flick through a magazine and I saw a project going on there at the Calgary Zoo, which was the Open Minds program. And there was a beautiful quote there from Andrea that was basically saying that it's the empathy that children develop when connecting to the natural world that's going to cultivate in them a love and a desire to protect and conserve the world around us. And I really resonated with that statement. I think Andrea's a wonderful person who's cultivated a lot of skills in the area of natural sciences and uh, protecting the natural world and also teaching about it and being a passionate teacher. So really stoked to have Andrea on the podcast today. She has an honors Bachelor of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism and a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a teaching diploma from the University of Waikato in New Zealand. Lots of travel experience and brings a worldly perspective to her role at teaching at the zoo. Has been a classroom teacher working primarily with First Nations and an informal educator for over a decade. So having a lifelong love of wild places and wild things, Andrea believes that by connecting students and teachers to the natural world in profound ways, we can create a future where nature conservation is paramount in all of us. And I totally agree. Welcome to the show, Andrea. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. How are you? Very well, very well. Stoked to be having this conversation. I didn't get to make it to the Calgary Zoo in the end, but I have heard from reading about it that it is one of the world's leaders in looking after animals. Yeah, I mean, our vision of the Calgary Zoo is to become Canada's leader in wildlife conservation, and I think um, it, we're doing a good job of that. I'm really proud to be a part of the organization. Um, the Calgary Zoo, you know, since I began working there about a decade ago, has always had conservation at the forefront, and that's one of the reasons that I was sort of drawn to the organization, because I think if you're going to have a zoo, you need to have that conservation piece, and it needs to be a strong uh, part of your organization's mission and vision, and at the Calgary Zoo it is. Um, So I'm just, I'm really, honestly, every day I'm just so um, feeling very privileged to work there, Um, and I feel like it's an honor to to take part in that work every day, Um, because the Calgary Zoo, I think, does a great, it's too bad you didn't get a chance to come, because There is the zoo, which is very front facing and that the visitors see when they come on grounds, all the animals, there's, you know, a a thousand different species that you can take a look at. But then kind of behind the scenes, there's all this amazing conservation work that is happening. And, uh, and it's, it's so nice to be able to tell that side of the story of the zoo um, that sometimes people miss or don't get to hear about um, because that part of the zoo is, I think, what makes it really special. Um, So there is 17 different conservation projects that the zoo has underway, um, and they're both uh, national, so like across Canada, but also international. Um, So we do some amazing work in conservation translocations, uh, but also with community conservation, um, mainly overseas. So there's, there's just amazing diversity of projects and uh, and depth of projects that are happening behind the scenes. That's amazing. Yeah. And looking into Calgary Zoo, first of all, what drew me in was this open minds project where schools can come into the zoo for about a week. I think it is an experience 
lots of different aspects of behind the scenes in the zoo. And I know that you're um, a big part of that process. So can you tell us a bit more about that Open Minds experience and how schools interact with the zoo? What sort of things do they learn? And maybe a little bit about the, the transformations that you've seen in the children from the start of that week to the end. Yeah, so I think uh, my program is really unique uh, that I coordinate at the zoo because it's a week-long program. And I'm really excited to talk about it today because I, I wish that it was something that was everywhere, you know, all over yeah. the world because I just think it's such a powerful program. Um, so what Campus Calgary Open Minds is, um, is basically a network of educators so it's not just myself. We, we work in collaboration with many other educators uh, that are sort of scattered around the city. So there's the Calgary Zoo, and that's one site. And we were actually the first site. So the article you read in the newspaper may have uh, been speaking about the 30th year anniversary because this program has been going on for 30 years now. And the zoo's been open since 1929. That's right. Yeah, and so this program's been a part of the zoo for, for just the 30 years. Okay. And then since that, since the first site at the zoo, there's been many other sites that have come on board. Um, and they're, like I said, just scattered around the city. So there's 10 sites in total this year. So we have different learning sites at the library and then at City Hall and um, at uh, uh, some of the different parks in the city as well. So Ralph Klein Park as well. So there's there's these sites that are scattered around the city. And what happens is we all work together, we all network together, and the students will basically come to the zoo for an entire week. And that's what they do at every single site. So it's, a, it's an immersion program, I would say, because they're not just coming for the day. Uh, sometimes I find when students come for a day on a field trip, they're just so excited and they, you know, are just trying to take it all in and they're rushing around and trying to see everything all at once. And it's very stimulating and it's very overwhelming. And um, with this program, the kids can come to the zoo, be in one place and sort of settle into the learning that is happening there. So the first day is full of excitement. And I mean, the whole week is full of excitement, but just in different ways. And I think after that first day, when they sort of get used to the situation, they get used to learning in that space, then the real learning happens. And you can develop a relationship with those students and the students develop a relationship with the site and within the community. And I think that's the piece that I love the most is that students get to know, you know, the site where they are and all the people that work there and all the animals that are there. And they come to know them by name and by their nature. And so I think that it's just an amazing program for connecting students and teachers to different places in community where they can learn. Um, so that's kind of open, Campus Calgary Open Minds in a nutshell. Um, but in terms of transformation, I think that, you know, students this year, for example, we had a class of grade ones come and the teacher said to me at the end of the week, she said, you know, Andrew, if you saw this student in the classroom, you would not recognize him. He's a completely different student. She said he has outbursts. You know, he has quite a few anger issues. He is, you know, reluctant learner. Uh, he's, you know, he, we can barely get him to write anything. He's a re reluctant writer. Um, but at zoo school, he was writing extra things. Like he was showing me stuff he was doing above and beyond what we were supposed to be doing for the, for the lesson. And I didn't see one outburst out of the student the entire week. And I think, you know, that's just one story that can kind of um, echo many, many stories that happen at the zoo um, when the kids come, because it's just a different learning environment. And for some students, I think that maybe struggle academically or that struggle being within the confines of a classroom and that kind of more rigid structure to learn. When they come to, to zoo school or these other sites, um, they're sort of released from that. And I think that for many students, it allows them to, to shine and to kind of show their abilities in different ways and to just relax and learn in a different way as well. So I just think, I, I really can't say enough good things about this program. I just, I think it's so amazing. 
That's awesome. So you've got these different sites around the city. There's different animals on each site and different um, exhibitions. Are they sort of, you know, how, how are they distributed? I'm, in, I'm interested. Are they all kind of got a distribution of certain animals or is one place more reptile focused and others is more outdoors well, well, plane type fair, animals or because the the calgary zoo is one site and we have a real environmental focus obviously because we have yeah. all the animals at the zoo and uh, we also have an amazing horticulture department and um and conservatory so we focus the zoo focuses mainly on those um exotic animals that we have okay. but the other sites are focused on different community aspects um so for example library school which is based around our central library the students are there all week just learning about how a library functions and what goes on in a library and then our, and our other sites so the ones that are more parks based they're outside learning in nature um, and so every site has kind of a different, it brings something different to the learning. Um, so obviously like City Hall School, we're, we're more focused on democracy and governance and um, politics. So each okay. site has something different to offer. But Zoo School itself is mainly focused on conservation um, and, and just learning about different animals and how they interact with their environments. And awesome. Plants. So, what was that? And plants as well. Plants and plants stuff. as well. Of course, so crucial. So, yes. the Wild Institute that you are partnered with at Calgary Schools is a is a big part of this program and um, the conservation efforts worldwide. And they have multiple different conservation projects going on. One of them, which is the burrowing owl. I wonder if you can. Um, tell us anything about the burrowing owl because we have that featured in our soil kit and I think it's so awesome to see that you know people think of a uh, soil animals as um, maybe a wombat or worms or ants but there's you know even uh, owls and alligators and things so <laughs> what's going on with the burrowing owl I love I love burrowing owls yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to see one, but I did get a chance Only on to video. <laughs> on video, okay. Well, they're they're pretty awesome on video as well. But um, I did have a chance to go to Grasslands National Park, which is one of the places in Canada where you can see them in the wild, and um, they're just adorable and they have yeah. so much personality and they're only about the size of a pop can, so they're very very small owls. <laughs> um, but they, 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 their habitat is prairie. And so I love to speak about them because the prairie biomes are also an endangered ecosystem. And I love the grasslands in Canada. And so there, that is one of the habitats that, you know, we like to speak to and, and try to bring some attention to because I think people obviously, and for good reason, love jungles and they love rainforests and all those other cool biomes that are out there. But grasslands are unique and amazing in their own right. And so the burrowing owl, that's where it resides. And for the Calgary Zoo, uh, we have what we are, what we call our facility uh, where we do the wildlife conservation um, breeding is called the Archibald Biodiversity Center. So it's located just east of Calgary. And so if you were to visit that center, you would be able to see burrowing owls there um, that are being um, basically overwintered, um, being assisted for survival so that they can then be re-released in the spring. Um, so we do what's called head starting at the Calgary Zoo. Um, and I'm not an expert in this area. We have biologists, specialists that are doing this work. Um, I just speak to the students about it and tell them these amazing stories. And But the gist of it is that we are taking the youngest owlets from their burrows, the ones that are least likely to survive in the wild, and we are overwintering them and helping them to survive uh, through that first year and then and then releasing them, re-releasing them back into the wild um, and then hoping that they'll pair either with each other or with a wild um, member of the population and reproduce and then continue their life cycles. Um, because these tiny owls, they're just amazing because they actually fly from Canada all the way to Mexico for winter. 
Um, and so another part of that project is just studying um, why it is that so few of them return from winter, uh, from their winter grounds in Mexico. So there's there's a lot of aspects to that project. Um, and um, so far, I believe this year was our 100th release of a burrowing owl. So we've released uh, around 100 now. Um, so it's, I think, a pretty amazing project for a pretty amazing little species. And That's they actually, so cool. yeah, I, I mean, some of the things I love about them is that they can actually hiss like a rattlesnake to wow. scare away predators in their burrows. And oh. uh, yeah, they, we, we supplement their feeding over the, over the winter and, um, uh, and then also we give them a soft release in the spring. So we try to help them survive for a little time in the wild and then they're fully on their own. Um, and then when they are released, they get these tiny backpacks that <laughs> sit on their backs with tiny antennas. And those backpacks are how the researchers will track them as they migrate down to Mexico. Um, so there's just wow. a lot of aspects to that project. What a detailed project. And see, I learned something here, which is I didn't even know burrowing owls made it up to Canada. In my mind, they were in Mexico and Arizona and like a desert bird. But the fact yes, that they have right. such a long migration pathway, that's really fascinating for a small bird. It is. Yeah, they're tough, tough little owls. <laughs> <laughs> and not is that but they get preyed upon by other owls because they're so small. So we yeah. have some big uh, great horned owls here, uh, coyotes, badgers. There, there are many predators that they have to deal with in the wild. So um, they have to be tough to survive and they have to have that healthy grassland ecosystem, um, which we're also trying to, to provide for them and, and help to protect. You've touched on something here, which I think is really interesting. So you said rainforests are really awesome but prairies are cool too <laughs> now this is this is a a concept here where oftentimes when conservation is taught in schools teachers are pointing towards some far away location not always but often and it's they might speak of the rainforest being burnt down or chopped up in the amazon they might talk about poaching happening of zebras and giraffes and rhinoceros in Africa. Um, but oftentimes it's not made contextually relevant for the students in their local ecosystem. So I remember learning a lot about Africa or the Amazon or even the Antarctic and the, the ice caps melting and all of that stuff's important because the whole world's connected. But research shows and i'm interested to hear your thoughts on this that pushing environmental attitudes on children too young and if those environmental messages are too far away and too far out of that student's control will actually alienate them from the natural world rather than uh cultivate a sense of curiosity and conservation in them and i'm just interested to hear your thoughts on you know, making education relevant to your local ecosystem and whether you've seen that environmental messaging or the fear-based messaging of like the environment's all going to, to hell um, because of, you know, the dangers of the industrial world and deforesting and seeing that as a, a negative influence for children that actually disconnects them. Yeah, it, it's such a great topic, I think, because I, I have read similar research um, and we do try to stay away from that negative messaging, especially with the younger audiences. Uh, <clears throat> and I totally agree that often they are being taught uh, about ecosystems that are so far away um, and that they're, they're not connected to uh, in any way locally. And so... We do try, um, you know, through our programming to really connect them locally to those ecosystems that are around us, like the prairies. Um, that's something we definitely focus on, I would say, for our programming, because um, there is a section of the zoo that we, we're, we're now modifying to be called Wild Canada. 
and uh, there are many Canadian species in that section of the zoo. I wish you could have come to see that portion because we have moose and, and wolves and, and bears um, and you know we're going to be bringing in polar bears as well, uh, muskox and uh, woodland caribou um, and porcupines. So those wow. sorts of animals, uh, cougars as well, like those are all in that section of the zoo and so um, in the past and hopefully going forward it's just been under reconstruction lately but we through the zoo school program it's uh i make it mandatory that in the middle of the week the students have to go there for programming uh with their teacher and so we um do different types of lessons there looking at skulls investigating skulls of just canadian uh animals um and speaking just about canadian um issues that are facing our environment so habitat loss that's happening within Canada um, but I think always always it has to be paired with hopeful messaging and hopeful stories because okay. I think especially nowadays um, students are just bombarded with so much negativity about what is happening in our environment and you hear mostly about that in the media um, just a lot of doom and gloom stories and so I think it's so important when they come to the zoo and they do these programs that you know we're speaking about the conservation work that we are doing and how it's making a difference um, and also just helping them fall in love with our local native species of both plants and animals um, things that they can connect with because when they leave the city I'm not sure if you had a chance to go to Banff you know but if they're traveling west they might see a bear they're they might see a moose um, you know just out in I saw a bed. moose I yes. saw a moose <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm so I'm so happy that you got to see a moose at the foot of the Rockies driving through the mountains it was beautiful they are they're amazing animals and so unique right uh, yeah. Just the massive size of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some kids, if they don't leave the city, they don't get to see that. But I think it's still important. I mean, I think that's one of the important reasons why zoos um, are are crucial, because, you know, some of these urban students don't get outside of the city much, even as you did, to see a moose in the wild. And so just speaking to them about, you know, this is our local wildlife and here are some cool facts about it. And this is why, you know, we should love these creatures and protect them. So I do think it's super important that we connect them locally, wherever we are in the world, um, getting them to know the plants and animals around them. Um, so I think like definitely we have strategies at the zoo to do that, but then even you know, if you're a parent or a teacher, just taking your kids outside into that local environment, local parks, local communities. And you don't have to, I think one of the things when I was a classroom teacher, I was a bit hesitant to do that because sometimes you feel like you have to know every species and you have to know so much about the environment to be able to take your students out into it, but you really don't. I think the most important thing is that you're just getting them outside and you're just evoking that sense of wonder about nature and pointing out different things like that that is that are cool um and helping you know fuel their excitement for the natural world i think that's all you need to do with how it can be simple it can be daily walks it can be you know trips to different places that are natural and then just taking time like spending time outside um because as you know, and I'm always preaching about this, I feel like, but, you know, you don't get to know people unless you spend time with people. You don't get to know, you know, your family and friends well unless you spend time with them. So it's exactly the same thing with nature. If kids aren't exposed to it, if they don't have the time spent uh, connecting with it and, you know, being able to like marvel at its wonders. Yep then they're not going to have that relationship and they're not going to care about protecting it. So I am mm. really, yeah, very passionate about, about making those connections. And I think as a teacher, you can do it. Uh, even if you aren't a biologist, you know, even if you love just math <laughs> or whatever your right. subject, um, your, you know, your specialty is, you can still go outside and look for math and look at nature and just excite students about it. Um, I know for myself, like I have a three-year-old daughter and we have some stumps set up outside on the pavement, like pretty big ones. And I just take her out there and we look under the stumps <laughs> yep. and that for her at her age 
is a amazing thing to do. And then we count how many centipedes we can find and how many sow bugs are there. And, yeah. oh, look at this spider. You know, I don't know what it is. Let's go and look in this book and see if we can find the answer. So it's more about learning alongside of them and learning with them and just sharing that joy of the natural world with them. That's so awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you've said in here that I relate to, resonate, think that are very valuable. Basically, that open-minded curiosity, which is connected to the Open Minds project and that you've said before that developing open-minded curiosity is the most important thing that can change this world. And I tend to agree. I think that childlike curiosity of as you say your three-year-old being fascinated by the the millipedes or the pill bugs that coming out of these stumps we lose that as adults but we don't have to and it's a a way of seeing the world i think that modern humans get very caught up in just ticking boxes labeling things and ticking boxes and you know going for a game of soccer on an oval is not spending time in nature. That's, mm -hmm. that's just doing an activity mm -hmm. outdoors. But that, like you say, that, that passive time that you spend just in a park or looking under a stump or balancing on a log or just spending, spending time out there, that's when you really get to know nature, not through the heavy environmental messaging or, um, you know, the doom and gloom stories or, you know, just reading about it. You've got to, got to really get out there. So I'm interested to, to, to know how did you develop this philosophy of yours? When did you realize that you were a nature, a nature woman and that you wanted to do this for your life and make it your life's work? Uh, that yeah I think I mean I think I've been naturally that way since I was born I pr probably if like you, you grew up in the country and out yeah, in the like prairie I, mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean I grew up in northern Ontario in a town called Kenora and it was just lakes and bush and um right. You know, we and I also grew up in the 80s, you know, and so we had a lot of freedom and we mm. would just tromp around in the woods um, for fun. And, you know, I remember just spending days outside in the summer trying to catch minnows and bringing them home and cutting up worms to feed them. <laughs> just, yep. like, you know, just like that was my that was fun for me. That's what I did for fun. And, you know, catching garter snakes in our compost pile and and trying to feed them things. That was just, I've always been really curious about nature. And I think that was just kind of innate in mm. me. But, I, I mean, I realize it's not innate in all of us. And I think that, um, you know, I... I've, I feel like I've my path has been a little bit wandery, you know, because I've always really loved kids as well. Um, but and I love their innocent joy and in things. And I love how excited they are and how they can help you see the world in, in new ways because of that innocence. Um, so I think like this career that I've chosen is just a nice combination of children and the natural world and connecting the two and then also just helping adults to um to share that joy with children and to come to you know regain that sense of wonder about the world too that like you said we often lose as we get into adulthood um you know we forget those those little things that um that are amazing about nature you know uh, and and we stop asking questions i think too as we get older you know, we, we kind of stop wondering ourselves because we, you know, we know a lot. But when you're with children, they kind of remind you that you don't know everything because they're always asking, they're always asking questions. And stuff. Yeah, and I wanted to say just on, just on that is that yeah. like, you said before that sometimes teachers get worried. Oh, I don't know the natural world. Like, I don't know all the answers. That's actually 
one of the best skills as a teacher is to not have all the answers and yes, to yeah. allow the students senses to 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 provide the answers like oh what's that tree i don't know let's go and find out you know what what's the shape of the bark like does it smell like something like what do the leaves look like oh that's interesting like have a conversation with the child don't be like oh let's go to the book and look up the scientific name right like, you're not experiencing the tree anymore yeah and i think another big part of that is just using really positive language because so many kids are afraid of spiders and snakes and right. all those creepy crawlies, you know, and, uh, you know, even the trees or the plants that are um, kind of mundane, you know, that yes. aren't big and beautiful. Let's take a look at those. Let's look at their patterns. You know, let's find out what makes them amazing. And with spiders, you know, whenever I'm pointing one out to my daughter, I'm like, look at that beautiful pattern. You know, it's look at the blacks and whites and how it moves. So trying to use that positive yeah. language with her too, so that, you mm -hmm. know, she's not, because you see the influence when she's, you know, at day home and she'll come home and she'll be really afraid of spiders. And then I have to bring her back. <laughs> like, <Yeah. "Whoa." laughs> you don't need to be afraid of, I mean, maybe in Australia, yeah, you do need to be afraid of. <laughs> but uh you know in canada they're mostly harmless um yeah. same with snakes i mean i'm talking about these animals we have in canada and forgetting that in australia yes you do need to be mindful but hey you um, guys have bears and cougars and skunks <laughs> and all sorts of other gnarly stuff so i'm, yeah. I'm happy over here i mean the spiders you know people people do blow it up a bit i think yeah, yeah. I, and it's fun to do that too i think yeah. <laughs> I think as well a little bit. But it's not that people um, don't get bitten all the time by snakes and spiders out here, but um I think yeah, it's you know, it's like anything. Sometimes stuff happens. Exactly. In the same way that, you know, you likely won't get destroyed by a bear if you go into the backcountry. But it does happen occasionally. Yeah. So there's there is that as well. Like dis but I think you know, looking I'd at me. I'd prefer to get bitten by a, a, a <laughs> deadly snake than eaten by a bear, that's for sure. <laughs> really? I, oh yeah, it's just funny where you grow up. Because when I was, I did go to Australia and I have some relatives there. And I remember, you know, being my curious self, getting up close to a spider. And they were like, no, 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 don't get close to that one. It'll kill you. So... <laughs> You know, it's just different wherever you are. But I think the main thing is just to find the beauty in all of nature that's around you wherever you are. Totally. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the activities that you do with the children at your school? Do you uh, distribute those activities based upon age groups? And, yeah, what are some of the tips and tricks that you feel like sharing with our audience that maybe – other teachers or other parents can um, to weave into their classroom to bring children closer to nature? I think one of the biggest, and this goes for all the sites actually, not just zoo school, but one of the big techniques that we use is nature journaling. Um, and yep. it kind of ties really closely into our whole philosophy. Um, so I think nature journaling and that's another uh reason that i love this position because i love um, art as well and i kind of lost touch with it for a while and then this job brought me back to my love of just sketching and looking closely but i think um in as soon as my daughter is able to and also just as a teacher um just getting students set up with with journals uh blank pages that may seem daunting at first but if you dig into a little bit on the internet there are so many great nature journalers out there and ways that you can connect nature journaling to the curriculum um, in almost any subject area um, and I yeah. think that it allows for a lot of personalization of learning um, it allows students to ask those questions and and be a wondering you know curious person um, and it also just gives them a way to document and you can assess you know what they're doing um, throughout the year so I think there's a lot of benefits to using a journal 
um, not just for nature, but for learning in general. Um, and a lot of the techniques that we use, um, if people are interested, come from Project Zero, which is um, research based um, out of Harvard University. And if you go to that website, Project Zero website through Harvard, you can find um, a ton of resources on um, different thinking routines and just different ways of learning. And those can be applied to journaling. So I think in terms of teaching, um, that's a really great place to start. And because it, it just opens up a whole new way to learn. And I also think that it takes away that structuredness of a worksheet, you know, and um, it, it kind of transitions uh, students to really doing things for themselves a little bit more, um, gaining independence, no. and then also... Um, the sheets and the Project Zero, that's really fascinating. I, I tend to agree that student diaries and nature journals are a really powerful tool and giving students just a question or a prompt and then a lot of space uh, and some art tools is such a beautiful way to explore. Now, for those of you who don't know, Life Rocks is not just a podcast. It is an education foundation centered around connecting children to the magic of nature through earth sciences. As a self-funded foundation and startup, we are constantly seeking support so that we can continue our great work. So if you feel called to donate to Life Rocks, please head down to the show notes and find the relevant donation link. We accept regular money as well as cryptocurrencies. We greatly appreciate you, our Life Rocks community. Now, back to the show. Did you want to um, wrap up any of your thoughts on that topic? Um, I think I think that's a great place to start. And I think if you want another great resource, you can um, look up John Muir Laws because he has some amazing nature journaling um, resources online that are free. And yep. I think they are great for teachers as well as parents. Um, but we do, so we, we do a lot of nature journaling um, in and around the zoo throughout the week. That's how we tend to learn about things. Um, but I also just wanted to add um, that if you um, are taking your students outside or uh, your children outside you know just take them with binoculars and a magnifying glass and get them looking at things and and asking those questions um because i think that's one of the best ways to learn too is just looking really closely at things and going beyond the obvious because uh i think we often we live in a fast-paced world it's always go, 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 rush here, rush there. Um, so I think just taking some time to slow down when you go for a walk and yeah. not always going for a walk for exercise, but going for a walk just to look and to listen and to use your senses. Because uh, I think that's another big part of our programming is learning through your senses. And I think that that is an ancient way to learn. And it's the way that our brains are programmed to learn. Um, so anytime you can incorporate any of the five senses, um, it just makes learning, um, embedded in your brain better. It's, it yeah. serves you better for memory and for, you know, those experiences, like those special experiences that you can have, um, when you see something exciting out in nature is, is just, um, can be a profound thing in your life. Um, so those are some of my, my tips, I think. Beautiful tips. Yeah. And tell us about some of the activities that you might do at the schools, uh, uh, at the zoo. So, you know, you've got the students there. You might do some of this journaling stuff, but how would you incorporate, say, specimens or animals or a plant? So one of the ways that we incorporate those things are using a lot of different biofacts. And I think this is something um, special to the zoo, but we have access to all of these great objects. 
And so when I say biofacts, I just mean a biological artifact. And so we have access to skulls and furs and, uh, you know, different sorts of bone sets and different specimens of butterflies and uh, lots of different types of scat, for example. And so yeah. really engaging kids and looking at those those objects and I think another key to that which goes along with everything else I've been speaking about is not um not just sort of regurgitating everything that you know about that piece but really uh -huh. letting them explore it first and yeah. ask questions about it and touch it and you know smell it even <laughs> you know all those things like we were saying and and then kind of engage in um, sharing the knowledge that you have, but also just asking them to dig deeper and to investigate for themselves. Um, so I think it's that combination of looking and questioning and then offering the the knowledge and then re repeating that kind of cycle over and over. Um, I think that's that's one of the most effective ways to use those biofacts. Um, so we use those a lot. Um, and then with plants, we, we, we're really fortunate because we have uh, what's called the NMAX Conservatory. And so in this conservatory at the zoo, it's sort of like an indoor jungle. So we have plants in there from all over the world. Um, and so we can take students in there and we can investigate plants from India and South America and talk about the chocolate tree. And uh, this is a coffee plant. You know, this is where we get our tea from. Here's a tea uh, plant, you know. And so helping make those connections, those more international connections um, and helping them see kind of and and think also about where their food comes from and how special these right. plants are you know so i mean i know um, not everyone has access to that sort of amazing landscape for learning but um when we do take kids into that space with their journals we're getting them to sketch the trees and plants first and then you know sharing uh, their our knowledge about them so i think those things in combination work really well um yeah and and then i think other activities we do um that are effective is we invite in community experts uh, so i think mm. because we have access to so many different people within the community within the learning community we can bring in people who are specialists in different areas and prepare the kids for them to come and then prepare them to ask questions um, and really try to get kids thinking about not just those surface level questions, you know, what we what we call Googleable questions, but getting them thinking about how can you ask a question that you can't find on Google. Um, so we we call it like puddle lake and ocean questions, and we're trying to get students to the ocean level of questioning, you know, where you're asking things that um, that are going to open up a whole new world of learning for you. And I think you should never stop asking questions even when you think you know everything about a subject so i think having those expert access to those experts um and allowing the students mm -hmm. to see you know their perspectives on things and what their job is like um is also just a great way to to kind of give meaning and value to their learning because then yep. they can see oh you know, this person is designs habitats at the zoo. That's a job that I did not yeah. exist, you know? Yeah. And these are all the skills that he needs in order to do this job. And so I need to finish my school so that I can do something like this, you know? So I think yeah. anything that gives learning purpose and anything that is authentic um, to the real world is powerful. Mm -hmm. That's all golden stuff, absolutely, is, you know, hands-on learning is something that we're really passionate about at Life Rocks because all of the literature points towards the fact that, you know, using our senses is the way that we create experience and memory. The most powerful memories that people have are almost always in nature. Mm. That's not a coincidence. It's the fact that, the textures of nature, the sounds of nature, the smells of nature, the uneven ground, the the wind moving against your skin, the sun 
changing the temperature variations all of these diverse unlimited factors are not in indoor environments so they don't actually stimulate our senses like being outdoors or in nature does which means we lose that nervous system activation which then we don't create strong enough memories when we're um when we're not activating all of our senses so i find that's really interesting ramifications for learning obviously if we want students to be engaged we want them to be learning in the real world but most of education nowadays is sort of shuffling us towards uh digital digital learning with um ai teachers or even programs doing teaching and i think that that's a problem i think that children need more exposure to careers diverse careers and like how's that a habitat creation specialist like that's an awesome job someone <laughs> putting backpacks on tiny burrowing owls <laughs> that travel across yeah. the land like that is a cool job but yeah. these are the sort of jobs that you don't hear about when you're in school unless you're in the right school unless you've got the right teacher who can sort of open up this world of things that is happening out there that is so fascinating and yeah in all of our kits we aim to have interactive elements even in the soil kit you know it comes with the digital microscope and different soil samples and we're getting children to go to different areas of the site and analyze the differences of you know how these soils look or um, drawing a crystal you know to engage with it not just looking at it or feeling its mm -hmm. weight but observing it through the perspective and the lens of art mm -hmm. and um i find that intersection of art and science very fascinating as well especially now we've got things like microscopic footage or um macro photography is this is this intersection of science and nature where it's like without those tools of art we don't actually discover what's going on there fully in the natural world so yeah i i think that those tools that you've you've been using in your teaching are basically the the tools to engage students in learning so yeah really cool do um, you yeah go ahead. Right. no you go i was just gonna say i really love that intersection too of between art and science and i think that even if you're not an artist and i talk about this a lot too it doesn't mean that you can't go out and sketch things and make those science connections because I've found personally, and I see this when students do sketches as well in nature, that they it just helps them uncover understandings that they wouldn't have if they hadn't tried drawing the subject or, you know, just taking that really close look at it. And even yeah. just in terms like the form of the form and function of a skull, for example, and thinking about the way that you know, a jaw works on a carnivore and the way that it mimics, you know, scissors and levers and, you know, that cutting motion of, of a carnivore's jaw. But you, you know, unless you kind of sit there and spend time with that object and, and sketch it or really just look at it, you, you don't have that opportunity to, to, do, to make those connections. So I just think um, art and science and that combination is really fascinating for learning as well. It's so fascinating and I think the way I see it represented in the First Nations people is that their culture and their art ex was expressed through the lens of nature and I think that you and I feel similarly that education can be focused on nature and you can still learn English, science, uh, maths, science, maths, art if you put nature at the heart of that, then all of the subjects that we are learning point us back towards connecting to, caring for, and working with the natural world. And I find that, you know, so fascinating to think that, uh, that nature and just simply the study of nature can nourish all of the subjects of school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say uh, my 
largest disappointment with the schooling system is that it's so focused on abstract topics that don't really always apply to life or apply to connecting you to the natural world. So I know that you worked in teaching with First Nations children. Uh, First Nations people are the the cultures that are still closest to the earth. Um, Historically, you know, not so long ago, they're living on the land and natural food ways and connected to the ecology around them. What did you learn from them? What did what did you observe differences in them and their connection to nature as opposed to say Western children? And yeah, interested. Yeah, I, I did um, spend about five years working on First Nations in First Nations communities. Um, and I just found it really fascinating because, well, one of the things I think that I came away with is that Um, In First Nations culture or Indigenous culture, um, they really just look at nature as another family member and that everything has a spirit or a being. So, you know, not just the, the living things, you know, that we consider living like animals and plants, but also the rocks and the wind and um, everything has that spirit and that being that they respect. Um, Mm. And so I think that's an important realization too, is just that, um, you know, they, they've often said, I've heard from several different people, the rocks are our grandfathers. And I think that's something, you know, through your, um, your education background with geology, you can really understand why, you know, that they've been around for so long and it makes sense that there are our grandfathers, you know, so things kind of, things like that that really make sense I think uh when you look at it from that perspective both from a western perspective and an indigenous perspective um but just treating everything around you like a family member I think is important because then you you will you will protect it and you will you know quit your job to go and protect something that you love maybe not necessarily quit but you'll take the time you know and and make the effort um and I don't know how many you know of us in like the western more western culture can say that you know you would you would stop what you were doing and put you know, protecting nature first. I don't think that's something that many of us can say we would do, that it's a priority in our life. But I think for Indigenous cultures around the world, you know, it's so ingrained in them and they are so connected to the land in different ways that for them, it's a priority to protect it. And I think that um, we can learn a lot from that. And, you know, with working with Indigenous children, they might not necessarily know the names of everything around them, but yep. they understand it in a different way than we do. And they know, you know, how, how, how to use it and they know um, how it's useful in their lives. Um, mm. And I think in some ways that's almost more important because they see the purpose in what's around them and how it connects to their lives and um, you know, their culture, especially Uh, Because with a lot of their culture, you know, their drumming and their um, their traditional dress, things like that, it uses elements of nature and you can't, you know, uh, perform in the powwow (laughs) if you don't have, you know, the right um, materials to use, for example, or the right drum to drum with. And a lot of those things come from nature, but also just, um, you know. I think more and more um, Indigenous culture is becoming um, something a little bit more in the mainstream because I I think that many people are realizing that there's so much value and wisdom there that we can learn from um, just even in terms of working with nature, um, you know, instead of against it to, you know, come towards a a common goal or something that we want to achieve, I guess. Um, I just think there's so much value there. And I've always, um, I've always wanted to, to kind of promote 
um, that Indigenous perspective as much as I can. Um, so I'm still working towards that in my position right now and trying to um, work with Indigenous members of Indigenous communities so that their teachings can be a part of our week, um, a regular part of our week, and so that students, again, can connect locally. Because that's the other thing about Indigenous culture is that, you know, it is based on local plants and animals. And so, um, you know, for the past year now, I've been going out regularly, um, trying to go out almost every weekend and listening to these teachings um, through just Blackfoot phenology about how the lunar cycles are connected to um, different movements of plants and animals and the cycles of nature. And um, so instead of kind of looking at the Gregorian calendar or Western calendar, mm. trying to look at our seasons through those lunar, lunar cycles and those different, um, yeah, that, that phenology perspective. So I've learned a lot through, through doing that. Um, because it's just a different way to look at the land too and to see it changing. And, you know, right now looking at, okay, when, when is the choke cherries ready to harvest and when can I go and pick uh, Saskatoon's and, you know, is it the same as last year or has it shifted a little bit? And so I think by doing those things and paying attention to those changes, um, it can help students and, you know, everybody just, pay attention to the land around them and notice those changes. And then when things happen to that land, you, you notice and you care and you, you want to do something about it. Awesome. Awesome. That really is. Yeah. You've captured the essence of the differences between Western education models and then the first nations understanding and it's it's even closer to sort of eastern philosophies understanding that all of life is connected um there's and and because of that interconnectivity they are like family members the rocks and the trees and the air and the wind and the waters and the animals and the plants really are and should be treated like our family because of you know, the interconnectedness of life. I think that Newtonian physics and reductive types of sciences and um, atheist types of ide ideologies have really separated us from that connectedness to nature, seeing things as just labelled bits and pieces. And um, But it doesn't really serve, it doesn't serve our life to think too far in that direction it actually does disconnect us and then science is coming back around and showing that okay so the rocks really are our ancestors and our grandfather because it was those rocks and those minerals that provided the first you know electron transfer with proteins in a pool somewhere on earth that may have been the precursor to life itself and that it's bacteria that feeds on minerals that then creates higher forms of life and and on it goes so really you know that original source of the let's say it was a big bang and there was this original point of creation well we're all connected back to that point and uh even quantum quantum mechanics is now showing that with quantum entanglement you can take two bits of an atom to other sides of the planet and agitate one little bit and it'll have it'll happen on the other little bit on the other side of the planet so there is this this unified field uh the indigenous were aware of that and they might not have known you know the latin names or um how how many centimeters their shin bone is or whatever the stats are that <laughs> kids will pick up yeah. out of a, a zoo fact book but they know yeah. the usefulness of it the context of it in life and and what it might be as a food or a resource and yeah that's infinite infinitely more valuable than abstracted facts yeah i agree and there's so much to learn there like the the depth of knowledge is incredible because 
it's so old, you know, it's ancient knowledge. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to bring it to the light because you don't want it to be lost. And I think there's a strong tie there to the languages as well. And there's so many indigenous languages that are being lost. Yes. And I think that the more that we can promote indigenous um, education and, and the speaking of indigenous languages, the more we can hope to hang on to that knowledge so that it isn't lost. Because um, people have to practice the language, they have to see it in the world, you know, they have to see that purpose for the language in order to want to learn it. And so, you know, when I was working with Indigenous communities, although, um, you know, there were language classes um, that were happening in the school system, I think the most, you know, most uh, effective way to, to keep a language alive is to have, to be around family and elders that speak it and to see that language being used, you know, in your world. Um, so the more that, you know, Western cultures can bring that in, you know, into the light and into, um, into learning, the better off our language, the Indigenous languages will be. Yeah, the Indigenous languages. And in Australia, I think there's over 500 or 600 languages and over 200 nations of the First Nations of Australia, and so many of those are so small, such small language groups, and small because of the ecological connection. So, you know, the environment can be so sp specific to a region that the, the language would develop in connection with the seasons and the plants and the animals in that area, and then if right. that knowledge is then lost or the the food ways are disconnected or the living on the land is disconnected then the language becomes less useful because language is just a proxy for you know whatever it is that we're trying to deal with in our day-to-day -day lives which i find fascinating what you mentioned of like the gregorian calendar versus the lunar i think it's so important to teach children it's the movement of these celestial bodies that dictates the rhythms and the cycles on earth. And that that's the real calendar. It's not mm. January isn't first, isn't new year's. It's, you know, the start of the lunar cycle, that's more new year's or the, the summer solstice, like that could be a point for new year's. So we need to, you know, shift the attention of children back over to these natural cycles happening in nature the lunar cycle, the solar cycle. I agree. <laughs> so, so it seems that intrinsic to the program at Calgary Zoo is really your partnership with your sponsor, Chevron, and the founder of that program and the founder of the school's program, Gillian Kidd. And I know that with most great institutions and people doing good work, especially in education, it often takes a exceptional partner and uh, maybe a philanthropist or someone who's very passionate about teaching to bring these visions to life. So if you could share a little bit about your sponsor, Chevron, and uh, Gillian Kidd, the founder. Yeah, I just, I think it's really important to kind of honor um the person who started it all, you know, who had that vision in the beginning. And so we owe, we owe all of this to Jillian Kidd. And uh, because I think what comes after, you know, when they have this vision, if they can turn it into a reality, there's just so much that's come out of that vision. And I think that those people with the visions are important to recognize because they're the people that are kind of stepping outside of what's normally being done. And, and then so many good things sometimes come out of that if the right connections are made. Um, so we were really lucky. Uh, Jillian Kidd had this vision and she wanted to make it a reality. She saw the learning potential of the zoo as basically a giant living classroom for students. And she just saw, you know, so much there that could be done in terms of uh, amazing quality education programming. And also just that taking that next step of, 
making it, you know, very much teacher involved and, um, and kind of over a longer term than just a day or an hour at, at that special place. Um, so yeah, it was thanks to Jillian that this kind of got up and running and, um, she managed to kind of connect with a local philanthropist who put her, um, in contact with our partner Chevron, an oil and gas company that has supported this program for 30 years now. And which is also amazing because often, you know, sponsors will come and go and, um, there's not that longevity to the sponsorship. So I think in our case and what makes this program really special is that we've been able to have that ongoing, um, that ongoing funding that we can rely on. And so it's really allowed the program to, to grow and to um, be shared with so many teachers and students throughout the city that, uh, you know, we often have parents coming into the program who have experienced it as children now and talk about wow their memories of the program and how they remember studying the giraffe. And they, a lot of them still have their journals from that time yeah. because of the, the longevity of it. So I just think those are two key pieces to this programming that are so important. Um, those partnerships that you can form. Uh, mm. And I think that environmental organizations need to, to reach out for and to look to um, for support. That's so such an intrinsic and central part to doing any impact type work in the world, I think is partnership and yeah, behind really any great educational program or um, change to how we're normally do, doing things, which the Calgary Zoo program definitely is. It takes leadership and it often takes a bit of funding as well, which isn't normally something that's maybe just normally connected to the person who has passion. Yeah. It's often someone's got the leadership and the idea, but not the money or so. Yeah. We really do need to work together to make big things happen. And that's so awesome that Calgary zoo has had a stable sponsor for all of these years. And yeah, really a testament to people working together to create uh, bigger things in the world. Yeah, exactly. And I think even, you know, with our, we, we've recently moved from our wildlife conservation center uh, to a new location and we're calling it the Archibald Biodiversity Center, Okay. which is where the cowboys breeds rare and endangered species. And I listened to an interview from Don Archibald where he spoke about touch points in a person's life. And he spoke about how when he was in grade six, he had a grade six teacher who had him do a research project on whooping cranes. And that really stood out to me because I think it speaks to the fact that you never know, and I always tell this to teachers, you never know what kind of impact you're gonna have on students. You know, they might in grade six, like Don did, uh, you know, do a research project or have this experience at the zoo. And even though he's not in the, you know, he's not an, an environmentalist and he's not a, a biologist or a conservationist, He's a businessman, but he, because yep. he had that touch point, he's able to provide that partnership and that leadership and that and the funding needed to allow this Archibald Biodiversity Center to be built uh, with his contacts and his funds. So mm -hmm. I think that's so important to recognize for teachers. I think teachers are amazing people and and that they can be inspiring, you know, kids of all ages to do great things as adults by just creating amazing environmental connections for them in their youth. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so, so true. And that's something really at the heart of life rocks as well is this understanding that if we have a nature connected individual, doesn't matter whether they're from the business world or the engineering world or chemical chemical creation world like whatever their line of business is they're going to have a connection to nature and that means that when they step in the world they're going to carry that close to their heart and try to do things in the world that protect and look after nature and as where the person who hasn't had positive experiences in nature and didn't have the right mentors to connect them to the natural world whatever industry they end up in 
they might just, you know, do destructive habits and not really care about the environment or not, yeah, not seek to protect it through creating, you know, more opportunity for other generations. So, yeah, super, super powerful message there and very close to the story of Life Rocks really as well of the founder being a geologist who had a love for nature and ultimately wants to create that legacy to connect children back to the earth so that, you know, the cycle can continue to replenish itself. So it sounds like very much a um, similar thing happening over at Calgary Zoo. Yeah. I've got Absolutely. a question for a zookeeper. <laughs> Have you ever had any zoo escapes on your hands? The classic zoo escape story. Well, I'm I'm not because I'm not a zookeeper. I can't answer it from a zookeeper's perspective. Uh, but I have heard stories through the education department um, just about some of the animals escaping. And we often get this question from students. <laughs> Almost every week we get that question. Has anything ever yeah. escaped? And so, yes, I, I do know of a few escapee stories. But one of my favorite ones, I think, uh, is with the colobus monkeys, because when you look at their jumping distance, some some facts will tell you they can jump 25 feet or so. Others will say 50 feet. So we're never really sure exactly how far these animals can jump. And when they initially built their habitat for them, uh, they did escape. So they just leapt right out of uh -huh. their habitat up into their rafters of the zoo where they weren't supposed to be able to go and so what i was told is that they had to station volunteers outside of the habitat to watch them and just wait until they got hungry and they lured them down with food and then recaptured them again um, and colobus monkeys are really intelligent species and they also have no thumb so they're amazing jumpers but they also don't have to worry about their thumb getting caught on anything so they can leap and grab things very easily and often in the wild they'll use branches as kind of a springboard for their jumps um so i can just imagine this happening <laughs> you know you're excited to let them into a new habitat and then all of a sudden they've all escaped and they're up in the rafters <laughs> and i think that's pretty funny and um it just goes that's to clear. show like you never know what to expect with the animals you could have the perfectly laid plans and then just like children they have their own agendas so I think that's uh, a great story of uh, escaping troop. That's nature for you, always delivering the un unprepared. <laughs> exactly. Expect the unexpected. I, <laughs> I asked you before this show, what is the most powerful change that we can make as a culture to improve the lives of children and generations to come? And you answered, to come to think of all natural beings in our lives as family worthy of our respect and protection. I think that's a really beautiful message. I think it's something that we can share with our children today and take a moment to pause and smell the flowers or smell the animal scat or whatever it is <laughs> that's out your door today. Um, Andrea, do you have any final message for our audience, something you'd like to, to leave people with today? I, I think that that, you know, what I had mentioned before is just something that I think about a lot. And I think with um, with students, with your own children, what I hope for the future is that, you know, it doesn't matter what they become as an adult um, in terms of their career. You know, if they're a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, you know, or a bus driver, whatever it might be, I think that no matter who you are and who you become, my hope is that every single person understands, you know, nature and understands why it's important and no matter what your job is you can find a way to you know protect a little piece of it and have respect for it and know that without it um we cannot survive as a species because we are so interconnected so i think um you know that's my hope for all the students that i teach 
and for the teachers that I work with is that they can instill that in their students, you know, that nature is just a part of, you know, us and that we need to all work together to do something to, to save it in any way that we can. A hundred percent and start, start local and think close yes. to home yes. and yes. little ways that you can impact the world around you. That's where you'll feel empowered to start mm-hmm. from. And um, if you are in Canada, definitely go to check out Calgary Zoo and connect to <laughs> Andrea there and all of the projects happening. Um, you'd be you'd be lucky to be a school child who gets to experience that. And I will be back to Canada and I will come to Calgary Zoo and we can do another episode in person and maybe you can show me a little bit around the zoo and um, we can explore the, the program more in depth. I would love that. I would love to show you the zoo and show you our classroom and and chat with you more about it. So thank you so much for for having me on. And it was a real pleasure to speak with you today. Thanks so much for coming on. And everybody, life rockers out there, I hope hope you've enjoyed the episode. And until next time, life rocks. Thank you so much for listening to the Life Rocks podcast. If you enjoyed the show, then leave us a review. We'll be back soon with more inspiring content. And in the meantime, remember, Life Rocks.